Is 29,000 boxes too much? I'll give you my take on this question and also talk about how many beta boxes should be printed. Hey, how's it going everyone? This is Hane from Wizards Den and you're watching Sorcery TCG News. Today, I'll be talking about the most frequently discussed topic in sorcery. Is 29,000 boxes too much? Here's the agenda. First, as an overview, I'll explain why there has been frequently debates on this topic. Then introduce typical arguments made regarding appropriate print run sizes and some issues with the reasonings. Explain my method, explain the calculation method, show the results with discussions, comment on how many beta boxes should be printed, and finish with my closing comments. So let's start from the overview. Discussions on whether the 29,000 alpha box is an overprint or not existed from the start of Kickstarter. You may ask, what do you mean? It was printed to demand, so there is no such thing as an overprint, right? Well, there are two cases that make this statement incorrect. The first case is when there are too many boxes in the hands of flippers relative to the demand. Flippers are the ones who are not necessarily interested in the product itself, but speculate there would be demand and try to profit from it. If there are too many boxes in the hands of flippers relative to the total demand, then it is correct to say that 29,000 box is an overprint. The second case is when most backers purchased more boxes than it was required to complete a collection or playset they wanted. This happens when the set size is too small relative to the amount of boxes printed. This is another situation where it is correct to say it was overprinted. In both of these scenarios, sealed boxes will flood the secondary market and box prices will drop. And in an extreme case, the price can go far below the MSRP. You may question, why is the drop in box price a problem? The answer is that it's sort of both. It is and it isn't at the same time. It isn't a problem as Alpha was already sold. So whatever happens in the open market is technically not a concern if the intent was just to end the game with the first product but it is a problem if you want to continue the business. Stores would not like holding products that result in selling at a loss. Heavy price drops in products are not a good message to the stores and distributors as that would indicate there is either a supply or demand issue of the product. If general distribution routes cease to exist, the game will die eventually. Not because the game was bad, but because of supply and demand issues causing the subsequent destruction of the product circulation ecosystem. As you can see the underlying effects of oversupply, this print run issue is a huge topic that is discussed as it can play a huge role for a TCG to survive or not. Two key factors that play a major role is the set size of the release and the number of effective consumers, which is the sum of collectors and players combined, or I like to say, the non-flippers. Both of these have to be factored in whenever making discussions regarding the appropriate print size of a TCG. Now let me introduce a typical argument and show that the reasonings are not sufficient for deciding whether the print size is appropriate. TCGM printed X amount of boxes, it was less than sorcery, therefore it is too much. Typical arguments go somewhere along this line with some arbitrary numbers added in the variables. How is this argument flawed? Well, because it is a complete different game. Everything is different. Absolute print runs, number of packs per box, effective consumer population, required number of play sets, target audience, etc. Just comparing two different games is not a concrete reasoning for evaluating whether the boxes are overprinted or not. Remember I talked in the overview that the population of effective consumers and the set size plays a key role? All the reasonings I explained why a simple comparison cannot be used boils down to these two key points. Without careful examination of these 
two key points, all reasonings are pointless. So what would be the more correct approach to this problem? Estimation of demand and supply should be made without comparing to any other TCGs. It should only use the two factors I explained in the overview, effective consumer population and the set composition. We have full information on the set composition, but have no idea of the exact number of effective consumer population. Therefore, we have to evaluate the supply and demand as a function to the effective consumer population and evaluate the results. So we could give an answer like, if 80% of the backers were effective consumers, then the supply and demand will be equal. That is just an example, by the way, the actual estimations comes later. So let me explain the mathematical model I'll be using for this discussion. Don't worry, it's high school level math, so nothing difficult. I'll evaluate function f, which is simply demand divided by supply, where each of them are functions to the ratio of effective consumers to the total number of backers. Effective consumers are people who are going to open the box to get the cards, which includes both collectors and players. Or we can say it is the total number of backers subtracting the flippers. Now, I am aware that there are some people who are a mix. For example, some people are going to open half and flip the other half they purchased. This is not an issue as you can always split that person in half and describe it as a fraction. Let's start from the easy part, the supply function. The supply function is simply the number of total boxes subtract the number of boxes effective consumer holds. The only unknown is the ratio of effective consumers to the total backers. Everything else are known as a constant. We assume that flippers will not hold any products, which is the worst case scenario for supply demand analysis. Now let's calculate the demand, specifically intrinsic demand. This is quite tricky as we all have different interests depending on whether you do set collecting or just get necessary cards for playing. This makes it complicated to gauge the actual demand of the types and quantity of cards. However, in the alpha set of sorcery, we have a very convenient card to model the demand in a simple fashion. And that card is the Philosopher's Stone. Whether you are a player or a collector, I am pretty sure all would need at least one copy of it. And conveniently, in Sorcery, a unique card is limited one per deck, so a playset is also one. So I will base this demand calculation on a premise that all effective consumers will attempt to obtain a minimum of one copy of this card, and as a result generates demand to consume boxes until obtaining the required amount of Philosopher's Stones. The resulting demand function is shown here, there are two new variables introduced, and it is the ratio of boxes opened and the circulation efficiency, eta. Former is pretty straightforward. It, if it's zero, that means everyone kept the boxes they purchased sealed, and one means opening everything. The more they keep the boxes sealed, more demand for additional boxes are produced. From conversations that took place in the Sorcery Discord, this value will likely be around 0.8 to 0.9, considering many people thinking of keeping at least one box sealed for every case. The second one is circulation efficiency. Circulation efficiency, eta, is a coefficient to characterize how effective the cards circulate between the effective consumers. This value will be between 0 and 1 with zero being no circulation and one having full circulation. As eta becomes less than one, effective consumers will be required to open more boxes than the minimum amount required to obtain the Philosopher's Stones for everyone. I'll give you three examples that result in the coefficient eta not equal one. Example one, I have a Philosopher's Stone and I know this is special. I demand two unique cards for trade. This reduces circulation efficiency as some cards require more than one card for the card to be in circulation. Example 2. I have three Philosopher's Stones. I want to keep one as a collection, one for playing, and one will go out for trade. 
This will also reduce the circulation efficiency as more than a single copy per effective consumer is removed from the circulation. Example 3. I do not trade any of my cards because sending cards is just too much work. I only buy cards and any duplicates I will keep. This will reduce the circulation efficiency as cards are only removed from the circulation and none are fed back. I am considering circulation efficiency to be somewhere between 0.8 and 0.9. Using this model, I have made some plots to visualize the demand to supply ratio. This plot shows the demand to supply ratio on the y axis and ratio of the effective consumers to the backers on the x axis. Circulation efficiency is set to 0.9 and different colored plots are for various ratios of open boxes. When all effective consumers open all of their boxes, the demand should surpass supply if 46.6% of the backers are effective consumers. If the percentage of the effective consumers are under this, there will be varying degrees of oversupply. Note that just because the demand to supply ratio is under 1 does not mean the price is going to collapse immediately. I would say it will be dangerous under 50%, but if it is around 70%, it should be fine. After evaluating the demand to supply function, we are finally at the appropriate time to inject our speculations. The question now is, do we have more than approximately 40% of effective consumers within the backers? And I say yes. I know there are a lot of flippers entering the sorcery market, but I also know that there is strong, genuine interest in the game. Yes, 75% of the pledges were obtained after the Rudy effect, but even those populations are not 100% flippers. There are people who got interested in the game from that. And judging from the final product that was completed, and from the experience I had playing over an year, I am confident that there is more than 40% of effective consumers. Also, looking at the average number of boxes purchased by backers, most people are short on supply. And this means that people who intended to keep sealed or flip half of what they purchased to recoup costs might not be able to hold true to their initial intentions. Once they realize they fall short on the cards they want, they will generate more demand for boxes. I therefore believe that 29,000 alpha boxes should not be an issue in terms of oversupply. Now let's move to the last discussion. How many beta boxes should be printed? Using the rationale used in formulating the model I presented, here is a plot of required boxes versus new effective consumers with varying trade efficiencies. I am saying new, as in the worst case scenario, ones who purchased alpha will not purchase beta. Assuming current effective consumers being 50 to 60% of the backers, which is approximately 3,000 to 4,000, I think doubling the effective consumer base within the next year is an achievable goal. Put it this way, every one of you recruit one person into sorcery. Sounds achievable, right? Therefore, a print number between 30,000 to 40,000 is the best number in my opinion. They should divide this number in separate waves so it doesn't shock the supply too much. As a closing comment, I am really looking forward to the actual cards being released in the secondary market as this is a rare occasion I will be involved studying the price dynamic of a startup TCG. Whatever the outcomes are, I think I'll be able to enjoy the full process of analyzing the data. What's your opinion on the print ones? Share your opinions in the comment section. So that's it for today's episode. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for future episodes regarding sorcery. Thanks for watching and until next time, have a great game.